My name is Jay Steckervitz, and I've been a blacksmith and bladesmith for the better part of the past two decades. I'm the demonstrating blacksmith for the Forge Weapons in Mannheim, Pennsylvania, and I can be seen doing demonstrations at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair and the New Jersey Renaissance Fair. In addition to these two shows, my work can be found at King Richard's Fair in Carver, Massachusetts, the Pittsburgh Renaissance Fair, and also on eBay. When I'm not demonstrating or making product, I teach weekend classes on knife making. A study of the hardening of steel shows that steel can be hardened by heating and quenching. Hardness, however, is only one of the useful properties of steel. Toughness, for example, is frequently essential. But fully hardened steel is not tough. On the contrary, it is usually brittle. To begin, we need to heat our steel. Now, steel itself can exist in several different states or phases. For our purposes here, we'll keep it simple and we'll say the steel is in a ferritic state. It needs to be heated to a point where austenite forms, and with most common steels, this is above 1340 degrees Fahrenheit. A simple test is to take a magnet and place the heated steel on it as austenite is non-magnetic. Once our steel hits this temperature, it's allowed to soak to ensure uniform transformation. Once soaking is complete, we remove it from the heat and then quench. The quenching in this case is canola oil that's been heated to 128 degrees Fahrenheit. This preheating of our quenching oil ensures that we have a correct viscosity to allow heat to be drawn away quickly, but we need to be careful that we don't overheat it as this can actually slow down our cooling process. Because there's not enough carbon in this steel, it remains plastic and it's able to be deformed under the hammer. The next steel I'm going to use in my demonstration is 4130, which is a chromoly steel, has about 0.3% carbon, uh, which is almost double the 1018 that we were using, uh, but it's still a very low carbon steel. I heat it up to austenitic, quench again in oil. allowing sufficient time for the temperature to actually drop. Take it over to the anvil and a few blows with the hammer and it breaks. So what's going on here? When we heat up our steel and we quench it uh, from austenitic, it actually becomes alpha martensite. Let's take a closer look. When we started, the molecules of our steel were in a configuration known as body-centered cubic, or BCC. When we reached austenitic temperatures, we induced a transformation from BCC to face-centered cubic, or FCC. At these temperatures, the carbon in our steel dissolves, remains present, and begins to fill voids known as dislocations. When cooled, alpha martensite forms very rapidly at speeds of up to 5,000 meters a second. Martensite forms a lattice of plates, or laths, and in doing so, the molecules are elongated. This is what gives martensite its hardness, but also makes it brittle. Before I move on to the blade in my next demonstration, it's important to note that normalization is very crucial. Uh, when we forge our blades, when we grind our blades, uh, we actually are creating a lot of stress. Those stresses can manifest in many different ways, especially with the thin shapes that we're using for blades. Uh, mainly, they can twist, they can bend, or uh, they can even crack. Normalizing is a heat treatment employed on steel forgings or castings, for example. These forged pieces are being placed in the furnace to be normalized before they are machined. Normalizing removes undesirable coarse grain structures that may have occurred during hot mechanical working in the forging process. Similar coarse grain structures occur in castings while solidifying. Normalizing produces a more uniform grain structure, better adapted to subsequent heat treatment. Sometimes normalizing alone is a sufficient treatment for obtaining the mechanical properties desired in the final steel. In normalizing, the steel is heated to a temperature from 100 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit above its upper critical temperature. In this case, 1600 degrees. Here again, the parts are held at sustained temperature until they are uniformly heated. After heating, they are removed from the furnace and cooled in still air.
Slow cooling in air is essential to complete the normalizing process started under the influence of high temperature. Here is what happens during the normalizing process. Before normalizing, the crystal structure at these two points looks something like this, coarse and non-uniform. Notice the considerable difference in the size of the individual crystal. Furthermore, the crystals in the wide section are relatively larger than those in the narrow section. As the part is heated to high temperature in the furnace, its varied crystal structure changes to one which is uniform throughout. Normalizing reduces the size of all the crystals. The result? A uniform, fine-grained structure. So I normalize my blade three times before I go ahead and do my heat treat. This particular steel, it's W2, uh, it's normally considered a water-quenching steel. However, in as thin a sections as I have forged it, I prefer to do oil quenching. Once it hits austenitic temperature, I go ahead and place it directly into the oil, uh, rocking it back and forth to ensure that I'm bringing that temperature down as rapidly as possible. Uh, once all activity is stopped, I can then go ahead and take it out. Now, when we're doing this, we're forming that alpha martensite. But alpha martensite is too brittle for us to actually make a decent blade out of, so we need to convert that alpha martensite into beta martensite in order to give it the toughness. So when we place it into our heat treat oven, we're raising that temperature back up, and what we're doing is we're forming sort of a compromise uh, between our molecular structure. We want a blade that's not too hard, uh, so it breaks, uh, but one that's also not too soft, something that's going to hold an edge. Now, the time and temperature at which we do this varies upon the thickness and uh, the composition of our steel. But I typically do more than one tempering cycle, and I'll start at a lower temperature and slowly raise that up by about 25 degrees each cycle until my desired toughness and hardness have actually been reached. It's also important to point out that you should never temper at too high of a temperature because you can actually embrittle your steel at temperatures above 500 degrees. My name is Jay Segerbetz. Thanks again for watching. Thank you.